Thank you, Margot. Thank you for having me. This is so exciting. I can't believe that the conference has been going on for 22 hours. So honored to be part of the closing session here. So um, I would like to start um, by talking today about data visualization as really a medium that in my mind stretches all the way from science, scientific insight, into artistic expression. And I hope you see why during this talk. Um, as Margot said, I co-lead the PAIR initiative at Google. This um, coming up here, I hope. Oops, is my team, my wonderful team. Um, and today, what I want to tell you about specifically is data visualization. At Google, we do a lot of data visualization for artificial intelligence. Today, I'm not gonna talk as much about artificial intelligence, but I wanna focus more on data visualization. So um, one question um, I wanna very briefly touch on is what exactly is data visualization? and Why do we do it? So the way I like to think about it is data visualization is nothing more than turning information, usually numbers, into images, right? Not only numbers, as you will see in this talk, um, why do we do that? Why should we bother with visualizing data? Well, it turns out that we humans are pattern-seeking machines, visual pattern-seeking machines. And so once we can visualize data, we immediately take advantage of innate capabilities that we have in our brain. So it allows our brain to do a ton of computation without us even realizing. It's immediate sometimes. And so this is why data visualization can be so powerful. And in my mind, data visualization also has a very distinguished story, uh, history. Um, and here you can see two of the pioneers of data visualization. And one of my heroes is Florence Nightingale, who was a nurse and statistician um, in England. And she literally changed the way healthcare worked because of a lot of the data gap gathering and data visualization she was doing of injured soldiers in the Crimean War. She was the first person to make a very forceful case that a lot more soldiers were dying in the hospital instead of dying at the battlefield. So there were problems in the hospitals. They were like, these people come here, they become even sicker and they die here much more in the hospital. It turns out that um, she was a pioneer of hygiene, of ventilation in hospitals. Um, and today we have much better healthcare thanks to her and thanks to some of the graphs that, that she created. Playfair, William Playfair on the side there created some of the um, first data visualization techniques, really important person as well. Um, Let's see if I can, okay, great. Um, we also have um, activists and, so, and, and um, sociologists. So W.E.B. Du Bois, he created these amazing graphs, um, really creating data portraits of the African-American um, situation in the United States around the turn of the century. The, some of the, the, the examples I'm showing here were created for the Paris uh, Fair in 1900. And one of the things that I think is also really interesting about his work is not only the content, the kind of data he's showing, but the aesthetics of how he's choosing, he's really taking advantage of the fact that this is a visual language. Um, and a lot of his graphs are incredibly beautiful. And then finally on the right, Dr. John Snow, who kind of solved the, the reason for cholera um, by visualizing where in London cases were happening. I could spend a whole lot more time there, but I want to very quickly say that, and up to this day, we have now, much more so, we have amazing data visualizations being done by journalists. And so you have some examples here from El País and from the New York Times. And one of the things too that I think it's important to appreciate is that 
even 10 years ago, you would not see the massive amounts of numbers that, that we as readers get exposed to today through these visualizations. Um, you know, decades ago, editorial uh, uh, desks at newspapers were very cautious of the number of num the number of numbers they would expose their audience to because they didn't want to overwhelm people and so we've come a long way in terms of allowing ourselves to really expose the public um, to complex data and I think that's very important okay so today, let me start by talking about my own work with Martin Wattenberg. And this first visualization is called History Flow. It's a visualization of Wikipedia articles. And it's an example of creating a data visualization for scientific purposes, okay? So we were interested in showing, in showing social data. This was back at the beginning of Wikipedia. Nobody understood what a wiki was, let alone how something like Wikipedia could even exist. And, and so forth. So we decided to visualize it. Um, this is a vintage screenshot of Wikipedia circa 2003. Um, and so we really wanted to understand how people were coming together and building these pages. So we found out that behind each article there on Wikipedia, you would always have a log, a article editing log. And so this log kept track of every change that happened to the article the timestamp, who made the change, whether or not it had a little comment, and so forth. And we decided, oh, this is the visual, this is the data we want to visualize. And, you know, these articles sometimes will have hundreds, thousands of pages of logs, because a lot of these pages tend to be very actively edited. So how might you edit, how might you visualize something like this? Well, we created a new technique. Imagine you have an article that is being edited by three people, Mary, Suzanne, and Martin. And I'm going to color each one of their contributions by a different color. So Mary is going to be orange, Suzanne is going to be blue, and so forth. And then for each version of the article, I draw a vertical line. Okay, And the length of that line is the length of the article. And so version one was all done by Mary, so it's all orange. Version two comes along and, and Suzanne says, this is great. I want to add a little paragraph at the end. So you can see Suzanne's edition there. Version three, Martin comes along and says, oh, this is looking good, but I really think we should, you know, shorten the introduction. So you can see that the orange line there is shorter now and, and so forth. So you can see how each version starts to change. Okay. Now to make things even more clear, Another thing we do is that we connect the pieces of text that survive um, in their entirety over time. So version one to version two, we connect the entire text because all of that survived and so on and so forth. You can see gaps where text was inserted or deleted. Okay. Now that I have a visualization of every single version of this article, I, I can start to play interesting games. So for instance, I can show the same data, but in real time. So I can show you that between version one and two, it took a long time, but between version two and three, it was really fast. So you can start to get the rhythm of edits um, visualized this way. The other thing I can do is I can highlight any of the versions um, and I can see the text on the right colored by the authors, okay? And so now what we're going to do is actually watch a demo of this um, visualization in action. Okay, so this is history flow. And what we're doing, we're visualizing the history, the evolution of the article one design. Here on the left, you can see the list of people who have edited this article. In the middle are all the versions, and on the right, you see the text. I also have a magic wand that I can move around, and as I move around, you can see the text on the right changing, okay? And I can scroll up and down, and I can just take a look that way. Now let's look at something more interesting. 
cat, the article on cat. So a lot more people like cat than design. I can see that because a lot more people edited cat. There are a lot more versions to cat. Um, and the article is much longer than design. There are also some interesting patterns here. You can see the stripy green and brown pattern. Well, what this is, if you look on the right, it's a table that someone added with, you know, the kingdom and the class and, and the family and the species for cats. I can also see this antenna at the bottom. And what that is, someone added a bunch of paragraphs saying, talking about the Unix command cat. And then on the next version, someone else redirected that piece of text to a new page called cat Unix. Okay, so now let's look at the article on abortion. It's a very long article, okay? But there is something interesting we hadn't seen before. There are these black gaps, these dashes. And what that is, is I had a big article and then boom, it's gone. It's completely deleted. Or here it's gone and someone said, abortion is great. And then they went back and said, abortion is good. So it's vandalism, it's called mass deletion. And if we start looking at the timestamp of when this happened at the bottom there, I can see 17th of December, 406, someone deleted it and it got fixed on the same day at 407 in one minute. How were they doing this? We saw this on Wikipedia over and over again. In fact, if I visualize it by real time, you don't even see the gaps anymore. It turns out Wikipedians have something called a watch list that allows them to monitor everything that happens on pages. And if they suspect there's some problem, they check and make sure that they revert the page to its um, original uh, or to its previous state. Okay, finally, let's see my favorite example. This is the article on chocolate. Very pink, nothing too dramatic, except when we visualize by versions. All of a sudden I see this beautiful zigzag. In fact, whenever I see the zigzag, I'm like, ah, I should have a scarf that looks like this. What is the zigzag? It's an edit war. Someone is putting a piece of text, someone is taking it out, putting it back, taking it out. If I can show you what this is. So a piece of white text was added, which is this paragraph that says, extremely rarely, melted chocolate has been used to create a kind of surrealist sculpture called collage. Well, this survives for a while until someone comes and says, removing Boyer invention. Daniel C. Boyer's come back and says, reverting, collage is not a Boyer invention. Google search for chocolate collage finds only Boyer. Reverting, leave your humbug out. Reverting, and so on and so forth. Daniel C. Boyers gives up, gives up at some point and leaves, which is unfortunate because afterwards Martin and I checked it out and chocolate collage is indeed something that does exist, but such is life uh, on Wikipedia. Another thing we did is to get rid of the color of the authors and just make text darker the older it is. Why did we do that? Because on Wikipedia, old text is probably a proxy for good quality, high quality text. And indeed, we did find many passages that were uh, quite old and you know, kind of passed the muster of, of the community. So one of the things that um, we did after creating this visualization was to download all of Wikipedia and start looking at some of the patterns we saw. So for instance, the, the mass deletion being reverted so quickly, we ran an overall analysis of the entire website and found out that all mass deletions on Wikipedia at that point, back in 2003, were being fixed within three minutes on average, which is pretty impressive. And so this gives you an example of a scientific uh, data visualization. The thing I and the thing I want to talk about next is data visualization as art. So a number of years ago, a magazine came to Martin and me, the Boston magazine, and said, can you visualize Boston? And we're like, what does that mean to visualize a city, if it, especially on a printed magazine? It's not interactive. How do we do that? Well, 
it turns out that Boston is a very seasonal city. So it, um, the, it, the seasons are very marked. So we decided to take all the public pictures we could find on Flickr. Does any of you remember Flickr? Um, about from the Boston Common. Boston Commons is the biggest park in Boston. And we were hoping that by having a year's worth of images of the Boston Commons, if we could bend these images by, you know, month. So here are all the pictures from January, from February, from March. And if we could somehow capture the colors of these images, hopefully we would capture something about the seasonality uh, of Boston. And so what we did is we started kind of squeezing, if you will, the colors from all these pictures. And we started counting colored pixels, okay? And so the more, you know, pink we would have, the bigger that bucket would be, or the more blue we would have on a month, the bigger that bucket would be. And once we had all these buckets, remember, per month, we turned them into ribbons and we put them all together, okay? And this is the visualization of Boston over an entire year with uh, January at the very bottom. So, Jan so the beginning of the year is at the very bottom uh, and then it goes uh, clockwise. And you can see that January, that's where we have our very serious um, winter in Boston, lots of grays and whites, right? If you start going towards the top left, you see the beginning of a magenta ribbon, right? A fuchsia ribbon. Those are the flowers blooming in the park. And then immediately you see a bulge of green there at the top right, at the top left also. This is summer starting. If you go all the way to the bottom right, you see a lot of earthy tones. That's the famous uh, Boston fall, fall foliage. So we were happy that you know, even though this is a very abstract way of thinking about a city, we were still able to capture some signal. In fact, if you cut this uh, continuous ribbon in, in, in the you know, very top of each season, you can see that the distribution of colors is quite dramatically different, right? And this is finally how it looked um, on, the, on the magazine itself. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk about is how do we visualize the invisible. How do you visualize information that really has no shape? Um, and so for that, I want to talk about the wind. Martin and I um, wanted to give the, ourselves this challenge. What if we were to visualize something that really people cannot see? Um, it turns out that visualizing the wind is something that has been happening for centuries. Um, this beautiful map at the top, at the bottom here that you see is by Sir Edmund Haley um, of trade winds. It's a trade winds map. Um, I think it's gorgeous. Um, and so you can see, and, and the top two maps are examples, much more modern examples of wind visualizations. And you can see that kind of the approach is to have a vector field, right? Where you kind of um, aggregate data and you find a direction of, of the wind and its force. And, and there you, you draw your um, vector field. Um, that's fine and good, but Martin and I realized that today, these days, you know, we have access to public live data. And, you know, NOAA in the US provides public data uh, that is based on a grid of sensors all around the country um, for free. And we're like, ah, this is such dynamic data. Can you imagine the wind is changing all the time? How can we show this in a dynamic way? How might we visualize the wind? And so now I wanna show a demo of uh, the wind map. So this is the wind map. And it's a live visualization. I am not showing you live here. This is something I had to record for the talk, but you can go to the wind map and, and see the wind right now all over the US. You can zoom in to your favorite city. So I'm obviously zooming into Boston. Um, and you can see you know, the, the direction of the wind, the speed of the wind. You can see the overall pattern in the US. Um, 
and how, you know, for instance, around the Rocky Mountains, how different and how much more kind of like trace tracery like the um, the patterns are right you have broad patterns and then you have very delicate patterns as well and this is one of the things that we thought was fascinating is how much the wind changes every day and we decided to make a, a gallery just to show people how how different it can be every day and so for instance on a day like this that i clicked on Canada was stealing all the air from the US, so much so that not even the mountains were, you know, stopping that from happening. There's a, another very different day here with kind of a diagonal pattern going on and winds coming together, winds partying out. Um, other days tending to look and almost no wind on the east there. And then there are days um, like this day here. And what's happening here is that Hurricane Isaac was making landfall. And remember, this is a live visualization. And so for the first time, we started getting emails from people in New Orleans saying, look, I'm sitting here looking at your visualization and praying that this thing passes over us. It was a very powerful moment because this had never happened with a visualization before for us. And it wasn't until we were in the path of a hurricane, so this is Hurricane Sandy also making landfall, that we realized just the sheer, you know, emotion and fright and just how powerful it is to have live data that you're visualizing and that others can look at, can relate to. Um, and so with that, I think we are done with the, yes, with the demo. And so, when you think about it, these are two examples from the wind map. This is exactly the same data that was being visualized in the in the older visualizations of wind that you saw before, the ones that use um, vector fields, right? But here, one of the things we're doing is we're aggregating a lot less. And so we're, I'm showing you a ton more texture and detail and very unintuitively, I think this helps our eyes to resolve the images and the patterns much, much faster. Um, this visualization was by far the most successful we've ever done to our surprise. So we started getting emails from farmers who um, use the data visualization, the wind map to decide when to spray their crops. Um, we started getting emails from scientists who look at bird migration and butterfly migrations. We got emails from teachers all over the country using the wind map to, with their kids, you know, their students, to understand weather patterns. We started getting emails from both commercial and military pilots to, that look at the wind map before they fly their planes, to which we said, oh, no, 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 do not use the wind map. We literally put a disclaimer on the website that said, do not use the wind map or its data to fly a plane, sailboat, or fight wildfires. We were scared because people were using this for real. After we put the disclaimer, we started getting emails like this one. We said, yeah, 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 I see your disclaimer, disclaimer but please uh, respect the power of visualization in promoting prevention of wildfires. And so um, one of the things to... Um, keep in mind is that this technique also, after we created it, it's, it's now used all over the world to actually show wind patterns in professional websites. It's part of the MoMA collection. And I wanna finish with this. Hopefully this has given you a, a sense of why again do we wanna use data visualization? The way I like to think about it is that data visualization is kind of like a gateway drug for statistics. It gets you there without a PhD. It gets you a long way without a PhD in statistics. Because of that, it really broadens the set of people who can engage with large, complex data sets. And by doing that, it helped raise the overall level of data literacy for an entire population. And I think that's key, that's important. We need more critical data literate consumers of information. And so I will leave you with that. And thank you so much 
for um, hanging out with me and looking at data visualization. Thanks.